welcome to my channel. My name is Erica and in today's video I am bringing you another episode of True Crime in Oregon. Now this is a true crime series I do here, I try to do here once a month. I have missed a couple of months back in 2023 and I will be doing cases from all over the place but because I missed a couple months I still had a couple cases from Oregon that I wanted to cover with you guys. Uh, this might seem strange because this is primarily a makeup channel, but I've always been very intrigued by true crime. And because I'm from the state of Oregon, I thought those two things would combine nicely, I guess. Now, this episode is about Adolph James Rohde, also known as Caesar Baroni. And I had never heard of this case. I'd never heard of him before. As I was researching true crime cases from Oregon, I happened to come upon this case and was just blown away, of course, by what happened in this case and just wanted to share it with you guys. If you guys are familiar with this case, let me know about that in the comment section. Now, all the information I'm giving you in today's video came from this book right here. It's called Dead of Night by Don Lassiter. I have the book somewhere. I just can't find where I put it. And it's a really well-written book, very detailed, a ton of information. I will be giving you a lot of information about this case in this video. But of course, I can't give it all to you because we'd be here for way too long. So if you want to find out more information about this case, I highly recommend checking into this book. I did get the book off Amazon. I will put the link, the Amazon link to this book in my description box. Now, as with all of my other true crime cases, I want to give a very big disclaimer here. Viewer discretion is absolutely advised. I will be detailing some very violent sexual crimes and murders, and I do not think it's a good idea to have young viewers around while you're watching or listening to this video. So without any further ado, let's get into the case of Jimmy Rohde, also known as Caesar Baroni. Adolph James Rohde was born on December 4th, 1960 in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He was known to his family and friends as Jimmy. Now the first three years of Jimmy's life was spent with his doting mother and adoring father, his older brother Ricky and older sister Debbie. And as caring and loving and as devoted as his mother looked to the outside world, by the time Jimmy was around three years old, his mother started to become very distracted, was not really as interested in mothering her children as she once was. And around the time that Jimmy turned three, his mother did leave the home with another man that she'd fallen in love with, moved in with him, and had very little contact with Jimmy or his siblings as they continued to grow up. Now, of course, his mother leaving completely devastated Jimmy's father and really traumatized Jimmy and his siblings. Now, about a year after his mother left, his father started dating a woman named Brenda. And not long after they met and started dating, they did get married and she moved into the home with the Rohde family. And she took on a very active mother role in Jimmy and his siblings' life. But right away, Brenda noticed that Jimmy had a real propensity for violent, obstinate, and disruptive behavior. And on several occasions, she recommended to Jimmy's father that Jimmy go to counseling, but that just fell on deaf ears. Jimmy's father never really pursued any kind of counseling for Jimmy. Now, Jimmy's father had a really nice job. They were very comfortable financially. They lived in a very nice neighborhood. And to the outside world, of course, the Rohde family looked like the ideal family, but behind closed doors, things were very different than what they were showing to the outside world. When Jimmy went to preschool, he started stealing toys from other children, stealing things out of the teacher's lockers. But because Jimmy had such a sweet, innocent look to him, he was never really punished for that behavior. In kindergarten, Jimmy became so disruptive that he was expelled from school. In grade school, Jimmy was caught smoking on school grounds and was so disruptive and so violent to other students that he was permanently banned from the school's lunchroom. As he went into junior high, he was threatening other students with knives. He was burning kids with lit cigarettes and being completely disruptive and obstinate in his classroom. When Jimmy was 12 years old, his stepmother was so tired of dealing with his horrible behavior and so tired of Jimmy's father never listening to her about his horrible behavior and doing nothing to try to like prevent him from behaving that way, getting him some help for his behavior, that she finally decided to leave the roadie home. Uh, they divorced, but she still tried her best to be a mother to Jimmy and his siblings. And as he entered high school, of course, his behavior continued and got worse. The problem, though, at this point was that Jimmy had grown into a very handsome young man. And so his looks, again, kind of like masked his behavior. 
Uh, and also he was very popular with the women. He was very attractive to members of the opposite sex. Now in high school is when Jimmy started to drink and smoke pot, uh, drink heavily actually. And then he also was taking drugs like Quaaludes, LSD and cocaine. He also started to like break into convenience stores, stealing cigarettes and six packs of beer. He also started to break in and burglarize homes primarily in a mobile home park that was right behind where he lived with his father and siblings. And his targets were primarily elderly single women. His MO typically was to break in through one of their windows, cut their phone lines, steal as much of their items as he possibly could. And then before he would leave, he would either urinate or masturbate in their homes. On October 5th of 1976, Jimmy broke into the home of 70 year old Alice Stock who lived in the mobile home park right behind his family's home. And she was known in the neighborhood as just the sweetest lady. Everybody went to Alice for advice and just loved to hang out with her and spend time with her. He held her at knife point and told her to remove all of her clothing. And as he was getting ready to sexually assault her, it's like he lost his nerve and he took off out of the home. Now, uh, she ran over to a neighbor's home. They called the police and the police came and took her statement and she very clearly identified Jimmy Rohde as her attacker. And at that point, he was sent to a Florida juvenile detention center for about two months. Now, in August of the following year, in 1977, he was arrested again for breaking into an elderly woman's home. And when, he, when they took him down to the police station and interrogated him, he admitted to another nine break-ins of elderly women's mobile homes. And right before his 17th birthday, Jimmy was sentenced to paying a very large fine and was also incarcerated at the Florida State Penitentiary. Now, initially he was sentenced to five years, I believe, in the Florida State Penitentiary, but they deemed that he had good adjustment and he served about two years. And in November of 1979, he was back home living with his father and siblings. But on November 29th of 1979, Jimmy went back to Alice Stock's house. He brutally strangled her, sexually assaulted her, and ultimately murdered her. He basically wanted to finish what he'd started with her. Even though they really suspected Jimmy had done this to her, there was no physical evidence. They found no DNA, no fingerprints, no nothing. They did find a shoe print in some like this sandy dirt right underneath uh, her window that he climbed through to get into her house but they weren't really even able to make a print out of that shoe print, like a cast of that shoe print. So he went unpunished for this murder and sexual assault of this 70 year old woman. Now in January of 1980, Jimmy's older brother, Ricky was killed in a car accident. And this absolutely devastated Jimmy, his sister, his father, and also his stepmother. And shortly after he had passed away, his brother had passed away, Jimmy went over to Brenda, that's his stepmother's name, Brenda's house, to sit down and, and talk to her about the loss of Ricky. They basically were gonna have like dinner together. And Brenda and Jimmy got up, walked into the kitchen so she could get him a glass of water. And out of nowhere, he starts to kiss her, fondle her, and the next thing she knows, he has both of his hands wrapped around her throat. Now he dragged her down the hallway into her bedroom and viciously raped her. And luckily she was able to convince him to leave at that point and not murder her. Cause I really believe that his plan was to murder her. And she did go and tell Jimmy's father that he had done this to her, but they agreed not to report this crime. This crime wasn't even known about until Jimmy had committed his later crimes, which I'll get to here in just a minute. Brenda really regretted not reporting that rape to the police. Now in April of 1980, a few months after he assaulted his stepmother, he broke into the home of 70 year old Maddie Marino and beat her ferociously, first with his fists, then he went into her kitchen and grabbed a rolling pin and beat her about the head, neck, chest, shoulders, arms, and just left her in a bleeding pile on the floor in her kitchen. Now she did call the police and when they arrived at her home and asked her if she knew who had attacked her, she said, yes, it was my grandson, Jimmy Rohde. So they go and they arrest Jimmy. Uh, they, he does go to trial for this crime. And unfortunately, they found him not guilty because the jury just could not believe that somebody could do something this heinous to their own grandmother. However, not only was he being tried for that crime, but there were several burglaries, break-ins in that mobile home park, and they were finally able to pin it on Jimmy. So at that point, he was finally sentenced to several years at the Florida State Penitentiary. So here he goes back to prison. And Jimmy was never a model prisoner 
ever. He was very disrespectful, very obstinate. I would constantly argue and fight with the guards, with the other inmates. I mean, people just could not stand him. Uh, he did attempt to escape at one point. Uh, he actually physically and sexually assaulted a female guard. And it's known that in 1986, Jimmy Rohde was Ted Bundy's cellmate. And other inmates and other guards overheard Ted Bundy giving Jimmy Rohde advice on how to be a better criminal, how to stalk women, how to capture women, how to murder women. And unfortunately, uh, even though you know he'd done all these horrible things in prison and they had kept tacking on more time, he never even served out his entire sentence. And in 1987, he was released from prison and sent back to Florida. However, he didn't stay in Florida long because when he was in prison towards the like 1985, 86, 87, uh, those years, he started to uh, communicate with a woman that he had met through a singles column in a newspaper. Her name was Kathy Lockhart. She was in her early 30s. She lived in Seattle, Washington. Very successful, very beautiful woman. And the whole reason why she was communicating with, the, with men in the uh, singles column of this newspaper is that she was hoping to find a stable and dependable man. And she knew Jimmy as Caesar Baroni. At this point is the time when he changed his name from Jimmy Rohde to Caesar Baroni. I'm not exactly sure why he chose that name, but nonetheless, that's what his name was and that's what Kathy knew him as. And they wrote each other for, I think, two years, very flirtatious letters. You know, they were both you know, basically falling in love with each other. Well, she was falling in love with him. I don't know that he was ever capable of falling in love with anyone. So when he got out of prison and went back to Florida, uh, of course, he was in communication with Kathy, and she suggested that he move to Seattle, Washington so that they could be together. And so he agreed. He moved to Seattle, Washington. They met face to face and were very physically attracted to each other, and their romance just blossomed from there. Now, even though Kathy was a very successful career woman and had a great job in Seattle, uh, when Caesar moved to be with her, of course, he was not employed, and he really had nothing because he'd just gotten out of prison. And they felt that the best thing for them to do financially would be to move to Hillsboro, Oregon and live with Kathy's mother, Joyce. Uh, Kathy basically just moved from the Seattle branch of whatever business she was working for to the Hillsboro, Oregon branch. And then Caesar took a job at a local cabinet shop. And in September of that year, I believe it was 1987, Jimmy changed his name officially to Caesar Baroni. And of course, Caesar gave Kathy and her mother Joyce and Kathy's brother this big song and dance about his past. Uh, he did, I mean, she knew eventually, that obviously, that he was in prison. But what he told her he was in prison for was that he was caught in a stolen car with marijuana. And that's why he was in prison. Uh, but he also told them this big story about how he was from Italy, uh, that he had all this family in Italy. Now, Kathy's brother did not believe a word of what he was saying. But Joyce, uh, Kathy's mother, was very enamored with Caesar, just loved him, thought he was the best thing ever. And so did Kathy. Now, not long after uh, he and Kathy had moved in with Joyce, Caesar decided to join the army. Now, because of his name change, they had no clue that he was a convicted felon. So, of course, they accepted him into the army. Initially, he went to boot camp in Georgia, and then he was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington, which is not far away from Hillsboro, Oregon. So he and Kathy continued to, you know, be, be in love, being in a relationship, even though he was living in Washington and she was living in Oregon. However, as Caesar was stationed in Fort Lewis, Washington, a lot of complaints began to surface about his behavior. He was being accused of breaking into elderly women's homes, accosting them at knife point, groping them, stealing things from their homes, and fleeing. Uh, eventually, uh, the, when the cops found out who was doing this and they arrested him, they determined that he was actually Adolph James or Jimmy Rohde and had a very extensive criminal background. So he was discharged from the army and basically just sent back to live in Hillsboro, Oregon with Kathy and her mother. Uh, I don't think there was any criminal charges brought against him at that point. Even though they had proof that he was breaking into women's homes, there was really no criminal procedures uh, or crim criminal charges pressed against him at that point. So as of October of 1990, uh, Caesar, of course, has been discharged from the army, is back living in Hillsboro, Oregon with Kathy. The two of them were able to get their own residence. They were married. And then in January of 1991, Kathy gave birth to her and Caesar's first and only son. Now, of course, again, to the outside world, Caesar looks like this just amazing husband, amazing father. Uh, you know, I found all these pictures that'll pop up throughout this video 
of him with this big smiling face, spending time with Kathy and, and his son. Uh, Joyce, you know, Kathy's mother, continued to just worship the ground that he walked on. But he was starting to really show signs of his true self. Uh, he was drinking heavily again, he was taking drugs, and he was having multiple affairs with dozens of women behind Kathy's back. She did eventually figure out what was going on, and she really just could not stand his uh, drug addiction, his alcoholism. And so eventually she did force him to leave the home and they were divorced. And not only that, but he started to commit heinous crimes all over again. In April of 1991, Caesar broke into the home of 61-year-old Hillsborough resident Margaret Schmidt and brutally murdered her. She was found the following morning by her caretaker. And as the caretaker walked into the home, she knew immediately that something was wrong. She'd been trying to call Margaret uh, the night before and couldn't get through because Caesar had cut her phone lines. And when she walked back to Margaret's bedroom, she found Margaret laying on her back in a state of undress. And it was clear that she was gone, that she was dead. And she noticed immediately that there was blood all over uh, Margaret's face and all over a pillow that was right next to her. So of course she immediately calls the police. The police come and start doing an investigation. First of all, they noticed that Caesar had removed the outside light bulbs. There was a light bulb in the back of the house, a light bulb in the front of the house that he had unscrewed and removed to like keep things secret or in the dark, of course. And then they noticed that he had gone in through a window and Margaret had kept a little jar of talcum powder that had fallen on the ground. And there was a really decent shoe print of a, a Reebok shoe in that powder. Now, eventually, after the autopsy, they determined that she had been sexually assaulted and had been asphyxiated violently with that pillow. And basically, the, the hunt for her murderer was on. But unfortunately, the investigation kind of stalled out pretty soon because they, they just didn't have enough physical evidence, no DNA evidence, nothing like that to really pin this crime on anyone. Now, in August of 1991, Caesar took a job as a caregiver in a nursing home in Forest Grove, Oregon, which is not far away from Hillsboro. And the strange thing is, is that he convinced his employer that he was a registered nurse, even though he wasn't. I don't know if they didn't really check into that or not. And he worked there for well over a year. And at this point, he became friends with a man by the name of Len Darcel, known as Germ on the street. Now, Len had a very lengthy history of petty crimes. And the two of them just formed this instant connection and this very volatile relationship and were spending a ton of time together. So in 1992, uh, that was when he and Len started to kind of go on the criminal war path together. And around 1992 is when Caesar met and fell in love with another CNA that was working at this nursing home. Her name was Sheila Hawkins. And they moved into the ground floor of like a boarding house in the Cornelius area in Hillsboro, Oregon. Now, the interesting thing about his relationship with Sheila is that she knew right away that there was something pretty off with Caesar. Uh, he was a heavy drinker. He was a drug user, had kind of like disruptive and violent behavior. Uh, also, she felt that he had some very sexually bizarre behavior too, to the point where she would never let her school-aged daughter around Caesar, like be alone with Caesar, because it, it frightened her so much the way he would behave. Also, she was very frightened by the fact that he had two guns. He had a nine millimeter pistol and a 22 caliber handgun. And unfortunately, on October 9th of 1992, Caesar committed his next crime. Now, Martha Bryant, she was known as the baby catcher at the Tuolity Hospital in Hillsboro, Oregon. She had been a like midwife uh, birthing coach for years at this point. She was loved amongst her community, loved amongst her coworkers, and she was a very happy married woman, loved life, loved her job. And on the wee hours of October 9th, she had just finished helping to deliver a baby. And her whole goal was to get home, sleep for a few hours, and then she and her husband were going to go on this really fun cruise together. She hopped into her dark green VW bug and left to go home. And as she pulls up to a stoplight on her way home, she notices this Chevy muscle car right behind her, revving its engine, a uh, really bright headlight shining right into her car to the point where she could barely see. And she's thinking, what in the world is going on here? And as she leaves the stoplight to continue on home, here comes this Chevy muscle car right up beside her, kind of almost like easing his way into her lane. And she was, you know, panicking, trying to speed up, get away from him. And he just speed up right alongside her. And the next thing she knows, the driver of this car 
has now pulled out a gun and is firing nine millimeter bullets into her car. One actually comes through the car, hits her right here in the side, uh, travels through her body and comes out under her armpit. So of course she loses control of her vehicle. She pulls off the side of the road, well kind of crashes off the side of the road. And Caesar Baroni, of course, is the person that is firing at her. He gets out of his vehicle, goes over, pulls Martha out of her car, pulls him into his car, rapes her viciously in the back seat, and becomes so angry with her that she's bled all over his back seat that he takes out the 22 caliber handgun and shoots her in the head with it. He then takes her body with her pants pulled down to her ankles and just discards it in the middle of the street and takes off. Now, there were some neighbors around where this crime took place, and they started calling the police, saying that they could hear gunshots, they could hear somebody arguing, they could hear a, a woman or a man screaming, and to please, please send police. So, of course, the police show up, and they see this horrendous scene. They see this woman who has been shot in the head, shot in the torso as well, with her pants down around her ankles, lay, bleeding to death in the middle of the street. And they also see Martha's car that's riddled with bullets on the side of the road. And they're just like, what in the world is going on here? So, of course, they start investigating. And at this point, you know, they're, they're piecing some things together. They do have some clues, uh, not a whole lot of DNA evidence, but they do have, um, you know, sp uh, spent bullet casing. So they know what kind of guns were used. They know that two different kinds of guns were used. And... They just have no idea who in the world would target this wonderful, well-respected, much-loved woman in the community. Two months after that murder was committed, Caesar committed his next murder on the evening of December 30th of 1992. Now that whole entire day, he and his friend Len Darcel had spent it drinking heavily and doing heavy drugs and were just on a criminal rampage. And they decided that they needed to find themselves a woman. So they hop in Caesar's car and they head down to downtown Hillsboro, Oregon, where there's lots of bars and dance clubs and things like that. And they happen to come upon 23-year-old Shantee Woodman. Now she was walking out of a bar. She had just shown up there not long before that to drop off some hot tea for a musician friend of hers that was getting ready to perform. He had a sore throat. And so she wanted to do something nice for him. And, and that was very typical for Shanti. She was known as a very good friend, always put her friends first, very loving, very caring. But when she got there, she noticed that her musician friend wasn't there. So she turns around, leaves the bar, and happens to bump right into Caesar and Len. So they strike up a conversation with her and convince her to go back to Caesar's house with them to drink there. It'd be more comfortable rather than bar hopping. So she agrees, she gets in the car, they go back to Caesar's home, the bottom floor of the boarding house in the Cornelius area. Now, Sheila was not there that evening. And they proceed to drink, and eventually Caesar takes Shanti into another room and violently rapes her and sodomizes her. And then Len does the same exact thing. And at gunpoint, they force Shanti back into Caesar's car and they drive way out Highway 26, which is like the coastal highway here in Oregon. It leads you right to the coastal part of the state. They take her to a very deserted part of the highway. Caesar forces her at gunpoint to get out of the car where he just taunts her and beats her and just humiliates her horribly. Ends up putting the 22 caliber handgun under her chin and pulls the trigger, instantly killing her and basically just leaves her in a crumpled heap on the side of the road and he and Len take off. Now, of course, her body is found and the police continue or start another investigation and they're noticing that the same handgun, the 22 caliber gun, was used in Martha Bryant's murder and also in the murder of Shanti Woodman. So they're starting to kind of piece some things together. And also as they're doing this investigation, they find people who have seen Shanti with Caesar and Len. So they kind of have some rough physical descriptions of Caesar and Len at this point. Now, a week later, Caesar commits his next crime. He breaks into the home of 51-year-old Betty Williams, who is another Hillsborough, Oregon resident, and terrorizes her in her own bathroom, attempts to sexually assault her. And in the midst of this assault, she has a massive heart attack and dies. And basically, Caesar just kind of like bends her over into the bathtub. She was getting ready to take a bath, so there was about two inches of water in the bathtub. He just bends her body into the bathtub and then leaves. However, he leaves behind his 22 caliber handgun. So the following morning, Betty's son shows up at 
her home because he can't get a hold of her and finds his mother dead slumped over the bathtub with her face and like two inches of water and he's thinking what in the world happened to her uh, she was handicapped so initially he was thinking well maybe she lost her balance fell into the bathtub and drowned but he could tell just by looking at her that she hadn't drowned that she had died before her body ended up where it ended up so you know, he calls the police and as they're investigating and searching her residence they find the 22 caliber handgun and as that is being investigated they quickly pretty quickly determine that that gun was used in the murder of martha bryant and also in the murder of shanty woodman so now of course they're desperately trying to find the owner of this 22 caliber handgun now as the investigation continues you know a few months have passed now as they're investigating different leads different descriptions of people that were last seen with shanty looking into ballistics evidence of the different guns that were used the the bullet casings all of that uh, Caesar just cannot keep himself out of the criminal spotlight. Now, at this point, he has moved out of the bottom floor of the boarding house in the Cornelius area because he's, you know, paranoid that they're going to figure out uh, where Shanti came from, you know, all that situation. So he moves in with a really good friend named Ray Price. And that is where he stashes the 9mm handgun. But in the course of the investigation over those few months, he viciously sexually assaults three other elderly women, one of which was a woman that actually moved into that ground floor boarding house in the Cornelius area. He shows up there to like hang out with her, like he'd befriended her, and they were like gonna hang out and, and, and drink and just oh, party together. She was an elderly woman and she was also handicapped. And so he took full advantage of the situation and he viciously sexually assaulted her. And after waiting, I think a couple of days, she finally called the police and she told them exactly what had happened. And she told them exactly who had sexually assaulted her, Caesar Baroni. And so they just start really investigating Caesar. They start looking into his past. They start finding his uh, associates. They talk to Sheila. They talk to Kathy, his ex-wife. Uh, they talk to a, lo a lot of different people, people that he worked with, his former boss, the cabinet shop, and they start really piecing together that Caesar has all of the traits that they would be looking for in these different murders. They also start looking at the physical descriptions that they're getting from the various crime scenes. They also start looking into descriptions of the vehicle that Caesar drove on the night that he killed Martha Bryant. Uh, it was described as a dark brown Chevy muscle car. And they pretty quickly determined that he did own a dark brown Chevy Chevelle, I believe, known as a muscle car. And they also find out that his real name is Adolf James Rohde and that he has a very extensive criminal background in Florida. And so they're really thinking, man, this really could be the guy. So they go to Caesar's current residence and they talk with Ray, his current roommate. And they notice right away that Ray is very nervous, very paranoid acting. Uh, not really giving them straight answers about Caesar and his whereabouts and who he is as a person. And so the cops decide, you know what, we need to get a search warrant. We need to search this house. So they do get a search warrant and they search the house and they find the nine millimeter pistol. They also find out from Ray that Caesar does own a 22 caliber handgun and that he hasn't been able to find it because, of course, he left it at the crime scene. So with all of these different things, uh, they're really building a case against Caesar. But the clincher here is that they find a young woman who Len and Caesar had attempted to pick up before they picked up Shanti. And they go and interview her. And she instantly picks out Caesar and Len's mugshots from a sheet of mugshots, gives them a ton of information about uh, the car that he was driving, uh, which wasn't the same car that he used for Martha Bryant, but just, you know, just identifying things about Caesar Baroni. Not only that, but Kathy Lockhart, uh, Caesar's ex-wife, her brother had reported the fact that his mother had recently passed away and that Caesar had broken into her home and stolen her debit card and was racking up all of these charges on the debit card, taking cash out, buying all these expensive gifts, giving a lot of these gifts to Sheila Hawkins, who she finally ends up dumping him, thank goodness. Because, uh, you know, who knows what would have happened there if she'd stayed with him. And also, there was another just amazingly wonderful key piece of evidence that indisputably tied him to the murder of Margaret Schmidt. Remember how I talked about the shoe print in the talcum powder at her murder scene? 
Well, that shoe print belonged to a very rare pair of Reebok sneakers. There had been very few pairs of those sneakers made when Reebok released that shoe. And one of the detectives was just hell bent on finding the owner of that shoe. And when the police issued the search warrant of Jimmy's current residence with Ray, uh, not only did they find the nine millimeter handgun, but they found the exact pair of Reebok shoes that belonged to Jimmy that left that print in the talcum powder. It matched perfectly with the cast or the mold that they took of that shoe print. And so they're just really able to start seeing Caesar or Jimmy for who he really is. So finally, they have, they feel like they have enough evidence, most of it's circumstantial, but enough evidence to really go after him. And they do arrest him on February 27th of 1993 and take him down to the Hillsborough Jail. Now, at this point, he's real arrogant, real cocky, laughing, acting like this is just the funnest time of his life, not really giving them any information. But as soon as they put him into like the general population of the jail, guess what? He starts running his mouth and telling anyone and everyone all about his crimes. Now, the thing is, is that he was giving some false information too, kind of interspersed with the actual details of what he'd done to kind of like throw the cops off. Um, he was saying that he used a different caliber uh, weapon, uh, saying that he'd used a knife, um, lying about what kind of car he had when he shot Martha Bryant, uh, saying that crimes had taken place in different parts of the city, saying that he lived somewhere else, you know, just to kind of throw him off. But eventually three of the inmates that he was running his mouth to had finally had enough. They could see that as he was describing these crimes, the sexual crimes especially, that he was getting like sexually aroused and it was just infuriating them. They were like, no, I can't listen to this guy anymore. So they did make arrangements to sit down with the detectives that were investigating this crime and just tell them everything that Jimmy, I'm gonna to refer to him as Jimmy from now on, that Jimmy had shared with them. And the detectives were like, oh, wow. So, even though they had a lot of evidence, a lot of evidence against Jimmy, what they really needed was like concrete proof that he had committed these murders. So initially what they did is they tracked down the dark brown Chevy Chevelle that uh, Caesar had been driving when he shot Martha Bryant. He had sold that to someone. Uh, I can't remember exactly how they tracked it down, but they did. And when they got there, I think the car was in, was in a different state. I can't remember what state it was in. But when they started to investigate the car, they noticed that in the back seat, the upholstery had been changed. So they go and they remove the upholstery and it, it, the, the cushion underneath the upholstery is soaked with Martha Bryant's blood. So they know immediately that, okay, this murder did take place in the back seat of this car. And there was no doubt in their mind that Jimmy had committed this crime. Not only that, but on the same night that Martha had been murdered, uh, Jimmy was pulled over twice in that vehicle right in front of the Tuolity Hospital. He was like cruising around in front of the Tuolity Hospital waiting for someone. I don't know that he was necessarily gonna target Martha Bryant, but he was waiting for somebody that would come out of that hospital that he could terrorize and murder. And now of course, with his own confessions in the jail, they know that they have a very strong case against Jimmy. So they go forward with it. And I, I think the real key part of this investigation, the real key that like tipped the scales completely, was the fact that the detective sat down with Lynn Darcell. And he at first denied having anything to do, didn't even know Jimmy. Then it turned out, well, yeah, we're friends. And then he finally admitted that he had taken part in not the murder of Shanti Woodman, but kind of like basically like her abduction that he had had sex with her. He didn't admit to sexually assaulting her, even though it was obvious from her autopsy that she had been horribly sexually assaulted. And that basically, he was too afraid of Jimmy to stop him from murdering her. He ultimately gave the police all the information they could possibly need about that crime from start to finish. And he said, as they were interviewing him, that he knew that his life as he knew it was over and that he was willing to take whatever punishment they gave him because he just couldn't live with the fact that he had taken part in this horrible crime. So Jimmy's trial starts in February of 1994. And of course, his defense attorneys try to find all these technical errors and tried to find fault in the investigation, tried to uh, thwart the jury, thwart the judge, you know, make it look like they had uh, come after Jimmy for their own personal reasons. But fortunately, Jimmy was found guilty. Initially, he was sentenced to death for the murder of Martha Bryant. 
And then not long after that, he was sentenced to two more death sentences for the murder of Shanti Widman and Margaret Schmidt. Now, Betty Williams was a little tricky because she died of a heart attack, even though he caused the heart attack to happen. Uh, they couldn't indisputably pin the murder, her murder, on to Jimmy, which really, honestly, really made me angry because if he hadn't broken into her home and scared her, assaulted her, she, I don't think she would have died, obviously. Now, remember at the very beginning or close to the beginning of the video, I talked about the murder of Alice Stock in Florida? Well, when the Florida law enforcement that was investigating that murder found out that Jimmy Rohde was now in prison for murder in Oregon, uh, they started doing their own investigation. They had continued to do their own investigation and they just couldn't find Jimmy anywhere because of course he changed his name. But now that they knew where he was, they indicted him for the murder of Alice Stock. Now, the, the tricky part of that too is that he would have had to have gone back to Florida to face that trial. And the fear was, is that if he went back to Florida to face that trial, he probably would not have gotten sentenced to what he got sentenced to in Oregon. So even though they did tack on that murder to his official criminal charges, they didn't sentence him to anything for that murder because they just felt like Oregon had done a decent enough job in giving him three death sentences. They didn't, they didn't want to screw any of that up. And one of the things that really just galled me as I was reading this book is that Jimmy never showed any signs of remorse. He bragged about these crimes to his fellow inmates. He acted like a complete jackass in court, laughing, mocking people, mocking witnesses, mocking the uh, family members of these murdered women. I mean, just absolutely horrific and disgusting behavior. And Jimmy Rohde died in 2009 on death row due to cancer. And of course, as with all of my other true crime videos, I want to give you my two cents here. Uh, of course, this is a very hard book to read. This case was just grueling on so many levels. Uh, the innocent lives that he took, uh, these poor elderly women who were defenseless, that he attacked and brutally assaulted and murdered, uh, you know, just awful. And again, here we have another case of a person that is showing clear signs at such an early age that something is not right. Violent, disruptive, obstinate behavior from, you know, like age three. And nothing was really done about it. Well, nothing was done about it. You know, his father never pursued counseling. The schools never really pursued counseling. I think part of that was because Jimmy's father was so against that, you know? I mean, the school can only do so much if the parent's not willing to go along with that, you know? And he just grew into this monster of a, of a human being, just absolute monster. And again, my heart is just broken for these victims and their family members. And uh, I don't know, I, I really do struggle with the death penalty. I really do. Uh, I mean, I, I, I do think he deserved the death penalty for these murders. But honestly, I'm just glad that he's not on this earth anymore. When I read that he had passed away in the Oregon State Penitentiary in 2009 from cancer, and it was, it was an ugly death, I thought, well, honestly, he deserves that. He, he did deserve that. That's my opinion. You don't have to agree with me. But I, I really feel like that I'm just, I'm just glad he's not on this earth anymore. Now I am going to try to have another true crime video up in the month of February. I think I might steer away from true crime in Oregon though and focus on a case from somewhere else. I have a couple of books I got recently about true crime cases from other states that I, I think I'm gonna do those and then maybe go back to a couple of my Oregon cases that I haven't covered yet. Uh, but uh, if you guys have any suggestions of anyone that you'd like me to cover in one of these videos, let me know. Uh, the only person that I am going to refuse talking about or doing a video about is Ted Bundy. I just, I just can't do it. I can't do it. So many people have done videos on him anyway. And I, I don't know. I just have this very strong personal conviction to not do a video about Ted Bundy. I really appreciate your guys' time that you take to sit down and watch this video. I know these are longer and it's very hard subject matter, but I, I so appreciate your time and just really want to thank you so much for watching. And I will be seeing you soon here on my channel. So you guys stay safe and take care.